Hello and welcome. My name is Eric Kessler and I'm a product manager for Amazon Bracket. In this session, I'm going to tell you about what's new with Amazon Bracket and how you can get started with quantum computing today. Before we dive in, let me briefly walk you through what you can expect from the next 30 minutes. First, I'll give you an overview of Amazon Bracket and how it has enabled customers to get started with quantum computing since we went GA. Then we will dive into the topic of hybrid quantum computing and we will see how we can learn from the field of machine learning to build more effective quantum algorithms on Amazon Bracket. And finally, I'm going to discuss how you can accelerate your quantum algorithms research using the new fully managed tensor network simulator TN1 on Amazon Bracket. But before we get started, um, one of the most frequently asked questions I hear is, why now? And the answer to this question has many different aspects. First and foremost, this field is advancing rapidly and we have seen important technological milestones over the past few years and overall an acceleration of innovation in the field. More technological choices become available and governments across the world are accelerating investments to mature this technology. But of course, for us at AWS, the most important thing is that we hear from customers across many industries um, that tell us that they're excited about the long-term transformative potential of quantum computing. And they ask us um, to help them plan ahead and identify opportunities and threats. We see more and more customers that are hands-on engaging these days with quantum computing through services like Amazon Bracket to learn new skills, build the expertise, but also to start developing new algorithms and develop the IP for when this technology is ready for prime time. So that is why we have launched Amazon Bracket to democratize quantum computing and make it accessible to every scientist and every developer with the familiar on-demand model of the AWS cloud. Amazon Bracket is a fully managed AWS service that makes it easy to get started with quantum computing. We have three pillars in Amazon Bracket, build, test, and run. First, we provide fully managed development environments based on Jupyter Notebooks that come pre-configured with a suite of software tools, including our own Amazon Bracket SDK. The Amazon Bracket SDK is a hardware agnostic programming framework for quantum computing that allows you to access different quantum computing technologies with the same programming experience. To test and fine tune your algorithms, we provide access to fully managed circuit simulators that are parallelizable, cost effective, and always available and make it as easy as a single line of code to run your algorithm and test your algorithm. And of course, most importantly, we provide secure and on-demand access to a range of quantum computers. Today, we provide access to three different types of quantum computers. First, we provide access to two quantum annealers from D-Wave. We also have an, a quantum computer based on, ion, on trapped ion technology from IonQ. And finally, we have Rigetti's Aspen 8 chip available, which is based on superconducting uh, um, qubit technology. And in the fullness of time, you can expect that we will support any major quantum computing platform and technology on Amazon Bracket and make that available to our customers. All of this is fully integrated into AWS to provide user access management, security, logging, monitoring, and more. And you can manage your resources like with any other service on AWS. And of course, most importantly, with Amazon Bracket, you pay only for what you use and without any upfront commitment. You can just open your, your AWS uh, console and get started today. And our customers are really excited about this because it allows them to understand and compare different technologies in this nascent field much faster and at much lower cost than before. 
where they used to have to negotiate and procure access with multiple providers and learn new, new programming tools for every device and every technology. With Amazon Bracket, Amazon, it, it, they, they have the, for the first time the opportunity to have a single point of access that allows them to evaluate different technologies side by side, understand their pros and cons, and get started with researching quantum computing for their specific use case. So now, what makes quantum computing such a transformative technology? Well, the answer is that if we had large-scale, fault-tolerant quantum computers, we could not only make things faster, but we could really solve things that are practically not solvable today on classical computers and won't be solvable in, in the future. So it would be a true paradigm shift, an, an, a really new approach to performing computations. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with um, applications in cryptography from quantum computing, but in my view, this is much less exciting than some of the other areas of applications. For example, with, with a fully, uh, with a fully full-scale quantum computer, we could design new chemicals for the development of better drugs or to make other chemical processes uh, more efficient. We could develop new materials, for example, for superconductivity that would allow lossless transmission of electrical power. And of course, there are many high potential and high value applications also in optimization, in machine learning and other areas. But of course, these applications come with one big caveat. To unlock these high value applications, we need hundreds of thousands or even millions of high quality qubits, as you can see by these rough estimates here on this slide. And this is far beyond the capabilities um, of, of today's devices. So what can we do in the meantime? The most promising approach to near-term applications of quantum computing, it turns out, are what is called hybrid algorithms. And these hybrid algorithms borrow ideas borrow powerful ideas from machine learning, as we will see on the next couple of slides. So hybrid algorithms use quantum computers as coprocessors to classical computations, very much in the same way a GPU is used to speed up the training of machine learning models. Instead of trying to execute an end-to-end -end algorithm, the QPU, the quantum processing unit, or the quantum computer, performs only short and bursty calculations that are within the limits of the capabilities of the device you're running on. And I want to pause here for a second because this is actually a very powerful idea inspired from machine learning. You know, instead of constructing a quantum algorithm from bottom up, you turn it around and say, I have a device that I know can do a certain class of computations. So I'm just going to tell my algorithm what I want to achieve, but I leave it up to the algorithm to iteratively find the best combination of operations within those bounds of my device to solve the problem that I have. Now, that sounds complicated, but it is exactly the same thing that we do in machine learning. For example, when we train a neural network. So when we train a neural network, as you see here on the top right side of the chart, um, the architecture of this network, meaning the number of layers that I have, the type of layers, how the individual nodes are connected, this architecture sets the computational bounds. And then the algorithm iteratively finds the best model within those bounds for our data. And it works the following way. We start with an objective function that encodes our data and our problem. Then we initialize the neural network with weights, so-called weights. And then iteratively, we adjust those weights based on how well the model does on the training data. And exactly the same thing happens in these hybrid or variational quantum algorithms, which you see on the top left. We encode the problem that we want to solve in an objective function. And in this case, for quantum computing, this can be an optimization problem, it can be a problem in computational chemistry, or it can be a machine learning problem for that matter. 
Then we parameterize our quantum circuit similar and, and, and similar to the architecture of the neural network, the layout of the circuit now, meaning the, the type of the gates, the depth of the circuit, how qubits are connected, all that now sets the bounds for the algorithm and the parameters can be freely adjusted within those bounds. And the algorithm just do, uh, does just that. It iteratively, iteratively adjusts the parameters based on how well we are doing on the problem to finally try to find the best solution to our problem. And this analogy doesn't stop there. It actually runs deeper between these two fields. And in my opinion, quantum computing can learn a lot from the insights and research in the ML, um, in the ML community over the past years. First, similar to the past decade or two in machine learning, I believe we will see an increase of what I call here adoption-led innovation. Because in this variational paradigm, both on the quantum computing and on the machine learning side, it is extremely hard to prove any type of hard speed up purely theoretical or um, a priori. And, and in many, many cases, the best approach is just build it and find out. That's what's happened in the machine learning community for, for, for many years now. The second point is that differentiable programming and sophisticated optimization strategies in this optimization loop that you saw above um, were and are the key for the success, for the widespread success of neural networks. And the quantum, commun quantum computing community is really just getting started to explore these topics and a lot is still left to be uncovered. And the third point uh, that helped the machine learning have such a widespread adoption was that um, there are mature end user libraries that make it easy and intuitive to build, train and experiment with machine learning. And we want to bring that experience to quantum computing. And that is why we are introducing and we have launched Penny Lane on Amazon Bracket. Penny Lane is an open source software library that brings machine learning tools to quantum computing. Penny Lane over many years has pioneered the idea of quantum differentiable programming by generalizing these very same ideas and machine learning concepts and apply them to quantum computing. More than that, Penny Lane actually allows you to use familiar machine learning libraries like PyTorch or TensorFlow directly to program your quantum algorithms and so to make it easy and intuitive to get started with hybrid quantum computing. Penny Lane comes pre-installed with Amazon Bracket Notebooks and we have a number of tutorials and example notebooks to get you started. It also provides access to application libraries for computational chemistry, optimization, and also machine learning. And of course, most importantly, Penny Lane or Amazon Bracket is optimized to allow you up to 10 times faster training when you use Amazon Bracket's managed simulators and their ability to parallelize quantum circuit executions. So let's look a little bit closer into that. In the overview from before, when we saw this iterative cycle, I was actually omitting one fact that makes the quote unquote training of quantum algorithms challenging. And that is that at every iteration of the algorithm, you don't just need to run a single circuit, but in many cases, you have to evaluate hundreds of circuits or even thousands of circuits. For example, to calculate the gradient of your objective function for the next optimization step. Now, at every step, these circuit evaluations are completely independent of each other and they can be scaled out easily to the cloud by using Amazon Bracket. In, by, by using one of Amazon Bracket's managed simulators, you can simply send a batch of circuits to Amazon Bracket and the simulator will parallelize the execution of those circuits across many compute instances and you get the results back um, after the circuits are, 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 are executed. So that allows you to speed up the training 
on simulators by 10x or more compared to when you do a local and sequential evaluation, as you can see in this chart on the right. On the x-axis here, we see the number of parameters and we're plotting the time it takes for a single gradient e evaluation. And the number of parameters is roughly proportional to the number of circuits that I need to evaluate at every step. And you see that compared to a sequential evaluation of these circuits, already for 20 qubits, we see um, a, 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 a 10x improvement. And that improvement gets larger um, as we go to larger and larger problems with more qubits and with more parameters to solve. So now let's, let's um, shift gears a little bit and let's talk about simulators. Circuit simulators are extremely important today if you want to do research in quantum computing, not only because they're easy and cost effective to debug and test your algorithms, but they are also used in research to evaluate the effectiveness of certain circuit classes for different use cases and to fine tune these hybrid variational algorithms um, before running them on actual hardware. It's again very similar to machine learning, um, to, to, to machine learning where you do hyperparameter optimization. So this concept also exists in quantum computing. But simulating quantum circuits is hard. Naively, if you want to store, if you want to just store the, the, the state of two qubits because of what's called superpositions, you actually need to store the amplitudes of every possible configuration. So you need to say the, 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 the part of my state that is in configuration zero, zero, and I need to store how much of my state is in zero, one, and how much of my state is in, zero, in, is in one, zero, and how much of my state is in one, one. So to just write down the state of a two qubit um, system, I need four complex numbers that I need to store. And if I just add one more qubit, I need eight numbers to describe the system. So we double at every step, adding one qubit famously um, doubles the, the, the memory requirement to store the state. And this, um, of course, if you take that forward, if, to, if you want to store the state of a 40 qubit um, system, we need 2 to the power 40 uh, numbers, complex numbers, to describe that state. And that is a 1 with approximately 12 zeros. So this is a large number. Um, and, and so we have this very naive and direct um, exponential memory requirement if we just want to write down the state of our system. Now, it turns out this calculation is a little bit too naive. Um, and, and, and there are more sophisticated methods in simulation to get around this memory bottleneck. And in particular, I want to tell you uh, about one of them, which is tensor network simulations, which allow you to go beyond what's possible with these brute force approaches by utilizing the inherent structure of quantum circuits. But tensor network simulations and simulators are often difficult to program and require deep understanding of the theory of tensor networks and tensor network simulation. That is why we have launched TN1, a fully managed tensor network simulator on Amazon Bracket that allows you to run tensor network simulations with a single line of code. And TN1 and tensor network simulations on Bracket are really based on three key insights. First, you actually don't need the full state vector to get to the results that matter. And that allows you to go past the memory bottleneck that we discussed on the previous slide. Second, there's more than one way to simulate a circuit. You don't need to greedy, greedily compute all the gates one by one. TN1 actually tries to find the best strategy first and then performs the computation after has have found a suitable, what's called, contraction past. And third, many circuits have special structure and we're trying to find that structure first. And if we find such structure, it can make it much easier to simulate a circuit compared to a brute force approach. So to just come back to the previous slide, if the size of the state vector is not what makes it difficult 
to simulate quantum circuits, then what is it? Well, it turns out that in a very real way, entanglement, right, so this, this foundational property of quantum mechanics, um, entanglement is in a very real way what determines the hardness of simulating a quantum circuit. And having this picture in mind can actually help a lot in understanding in which situations TN1 can provide an advantage over a brute force approach. Because we know for entanglement to spread through a quantum circuit, the structure of that circuit matters a lot. For example, entanglement spread is slowed down if you have local gates, so gates that only interact with, so one qubit can only have a gate with its neighboring qubits. Or you have sparse circuits where you only have an interaction gate every now and then. Or you have individual group of qubits, groups of qubits that are only weakly interacting with each other. Or you have shallow circuits for that matter, right? So where there's not much time for entanglement to spread through the entire system. And these things become quite intuitive when you consider the graph that give tensor networks their name. Right? So TN1 maps every quantum circuit to a graph like this one that you see on the left-hand side, where the blue nodes um, all the way to the right of the graph are the individual qubits, and then every node that you see is a gate that is either applied to that individual qubit, or if there are two nodes that are connected, this is a two-qubit gate. Yeah? And so you see um, there is this inherent structure in this example. Um, in order, to, in order to entangle, for example, the qubit all the way on the bottom with the qubit all the way on the top, I need to fully traverse this graph. Uh, and because in this example, all gates are local, right? so you see the edges between the nodes are always only between neighbors, it takes me a long time to traverse that entire graph. If I had a gate between the bottom qubit and the top qubit directly, entanglement could spread much faster. And obviously, as we're traversing through that graph, the depth of the circuit also matters a lot. So having this picture in mind helps you think about how entanglement spreads. And TN1 detects that structure, detects how the circuit looks like um, to uh, first find the best path how to calculate the final results that you, um, that you want to get. So let's see this in action. Let's take, for example, the case of a quantum Fourier transform. For a state vector simulator, a simulator that is based on brute force uh, quantum circuit simulation, it is as a quantum Fourier transform is as hard as any circuit to simulate. And in this plot here, where we see on the x-axis the number of qubits in my quantum Fourier transform and the runtime on the y-axis, you very clearly see in the pink curve that exponential scaling, which directly comes from the memory explosion that we discussed. TN1, in contrast, is able to use the inherent structure of the quantum Fourier transform applied to a specific initial state to achieve a near linear runtime and much faster and, able to, and is able to go um, to much larger qubit numbers. It is this you know, this quantum Fourier transform is a little bit of a um, pathological example here, but as, as you'll see, that there are many um, circuits that have inherent structure. This is often the case in optimization and also for hardware-specific algorithms. Now, it is important to note that TN1, or tensor network simulations, are not always the better choice for smaller circuits, circuits with all-to-all -all connectivity, or circuits with a large depth where entanglement has enough time to spread through the entire system. SV1, our state vector simulator on Amazon Bracket, usually is the better choice. As mentioned before, TN1 is fully managed and you can simply run circuits with a single line of code. There is no manual setup, no installation or management of infrastructure required to help you accelerate um, your research in hardware-specific algorithms um, on Amazon Bracket. So to summarize, let's have a look again at the three pillars of Amazon Bracket. When you work with hybrid 
algorithms. Your typical workflow, in your typical workflow, you would build your algorithms using our managed Jupyter environments. Then to test and fine tune them with hyperparameter optimization, you can use Amazon Brackets managed sim simulators before you finally run these algorithms on actual quantum computing hardware. And of course, this is usually not a linear process, but you go back and forth between the different stages and Amazon Bracket makes that easy for you. Now, with our recent launches, we're trying to help to accelerate that experimentation cycle. We launched Penny Lane on Amazon Bracket to make it easy to build variational algorithms with familiar machine learning tooling and get started with application libraries in chemistry, machine learning, and, op and, and optimization. And we have also seen that Penny Lane and Amazon Bracket is a powerful combination, allowing for 10 times faster training times when you use Amazon Bracket's uh, managed simulators by parallelizing tasks and by intuitively and, and easily scaling out to the cloud. And with the launch of TN1, our managed tensor network simulators, we give customers more tools to research new classes of quantum algorithms. Last but not least, um, we have also recently launched, and we don't go into much detail here, but I do want to mention it, um, what's called manual qubit allocation, uh, which allows you to specify the individual qubits when you use a Rigetti device as a first step to give customers more low-level control over the devices on Amazon Bracket, and there's more to come um, over the next month. So with, with that, I would like to thank you very much for joining this session. We invite you to log into your AWS console and try out these new features today. We're looking very much forward to hearing your feedback. Um, please fill out the survey, and we're super excited to continue to bring quantum computing technologies to you and every customer on AWS. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of reInvent.